morning, Antioch, and thanks for being with us here on a Memorial Day holiday. Um, and we want to remember those that have served and given their lives for this country. Uh, my dad was in the military, but I'm named after my uncle Kenny, uh, who was with the D-Day uh, landing invasion forces and followed behind tanks all the way into Germany. Didn't come back the same and, and then eventually passed on later. Um, and if you need to know, my, my name was Kenny for a long time. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, just want to take a minute and remember that. And those of you that are serving and have served or serve in any kind of a first responder capacity. So thank you for that sacrifice. Um, it's a fun Sunday for me. I have some friends here. Um, Aaron and Kelsey Sams were a part of my college group way back when I was in California. And Aaron and I were in both of each other's weddings way back in the day. Um, and uh, it's kind of fun to have them here. They're here for a wedding in town. We get to hang out and have lunch with them and their three kids. And Aaron actually shows up in my, my book, Create vs. Copy. He's one of the co-founders of what became known as the Flip Classroom Movement when he was a, a chemistry teacher um, back in Colorado about a decade or so ago uh, using new technologies and kind of how to innovatively flip that. So kind of fun to have them with us this Sunday morning. Um, and I'm hoping I don't screw up because of it, so, um, it'll, uh, yeah, that and jet lag. Um, I'm going to do something I've never done before. I would love for you to take out this sheet of paper that you got on the way in, and if you didn't get one, just raise your hand, and we'll make sure we get one to you, and we're going to take a few moments and just read this in silence. And so basically the idea that all of Scripture and even the themes that we deal with on a regular basis are much more holistic than we tend to take them. And so I just want us to take some time and read Colossians chapter 3. This is out of the NIV. And just go ahead and read it in silence, and we'll come back here in a minute. So as you're finishing up, basically you see an interesting picture in Colossians 3 of as living as those who are now in Christ, that the old life is gone, the new has come, and that we live a different kind of life, that we do it corporately, we do it together, uh, we do it with mutuality. And as we work at a lot of different kinds of things, we come in the end to instruction specifically with relationships and what work looks like there. Work is this interesting thing. I spent the last couple weeks trying to reflect on what what my earliest memories of work are or have been. So if you think about going back to your earliest memories and just think what comes out like or jumps out at you as work that, that stayed with you, that was heavy, that took energy or effort. And interesting thing is I came up with what a memory that I think was when I was about five years old, lived in the Netherlands, and I rolled a snowball and it was really wet snow, rolled the snowball all day and got you know, several streets over. And this thing had packed down really big and gotten really solid. And then I couldn't move it anymore. And it was there kind of in the middle of the road and I didn't know what to do. And my mom likes to tell the story. I just remember kind of sitting there like Rodan's thinking man, just not knowing how to, to deal with this paradox of my snowball um, being not at my home and not knowing where to go with it. Um, that was kind of my earliest memory of like sitting there with stress or work or effort. When I was six, I, it was kind of the next memory I came to, and it was like a longer one, a different kind of work memory. My parents had put me in an English-speaking school. Uh, we were going to be going back to the United States. Um, later on that following year, they were worried about my English, my English speaking um, being problematic and they wanted me to be in an English-speaking school so that I'd go back and I wouldn't be behind my peers. Um, so in case you know, um, don't know, I'm, I'm the only person who used to be bilingual but isn't um, that I know of. Um, <laughs> thanks, Dad. Um, uh, and I remember at this English-speaking school, they had a flagpole. And this flagpole started out about this, this big around and just went way up into the sky. Uh, and I was smaller, so maybe not as high as I thought it did. And it had lots of kind of ropes and things along it. But every day I thought on recess and on lunch break that I should 
figure out how to climb that pole. Um, but it was so big round at the bottom and went up so high that even though I, I, I was a bit carefree, I lived with this kind of anxiety that if I tried to climb that flagpole, I don't know that I could make it all the way. And, and that if I fell, it would be really bad. Yet it kept calling to me. And I lived every day with this kind of stress of this flagpole kind of there in the schoolyard, unclimbed. And, it, and it, it was weird for me. Like I remember that as a type of work, um, really strange. I remember also being in the Netherlands and a different kind of work. We were on a bike ride and a family member fell um, and was hurt and it, and it slowed things down for an hour or so. And I remember being really, really stressed and feeling like I was suffering uh, a lot um, to have to endure this and to wait on a person. Um, it's, a, it's a form of, of labor to have to wait on somebody when, when you feel like they are getting in the way of your life. I'm dead, I'm dead serious. Um, different kind of work, uh, playing it forward, moved to the Bay Area. We were in a city called Milpitas. It's near San Jose. I played sports. Uh, I loved baseball. And this is when I was about nine years old. And we were practicing at the park just down from my house one day. And um, the coach was hitting kind of pop flies out into the outfield. I, I, was, I was good at the hand-eye part of baseball, uh, actually really good at that part. was not really good at the strength part or the speed part. Um, but, uh, but I could always catch field really well. Um, there's some people in this church that watch me hurt myself playing softball, I don't know, about six years ago that would differ. Um, but back then, uh, I could feel really, really well and I could hit really well. And this interesting thing happened. The coach hits this uh, kind of a pop flying in, into the outfield. And I ran, I ran, and it was kind of that moment when you were living out your dreams, like what a hero would do. I dove, I caught the ball, I, I flipped over, rolled a couple times, and the, nobody saw it. Um, but the ball dribbled out of my glove. So technically speaking, I caught it, but not really. Um, and I've never told this story, actually, ever, till this day. Um, but I've lived with it, you know. And so the coach, the coach yelled out and was amazed and asked, did you catch that? And I said, yes. Um, and everybody was kind of amazed, and the coach was amazed, and I knew I didn't technically <laughs> catch it. And about four weeks later, um, we were playing on a Saturday morning, and we were in the dugout. You, you know that a dugout is a, a descriptive word for real baseball diamonds where there's a dugout. Um, young, young kids play with just a metal fence in like a rectangle, and it's called the dugout. Does that make sense? You're on a bench, basically. And this coach who was a, uh, a dad, must have been a dad, um, and I can picture it today, he was talking at us through the fence, and we were all sitting on the bench, and I was kind of in the middle, and he said to the whole team, um, he said, Ken is the best baseball player on this team. You guys should watch him, and you guys should play like that. Now, I might have, and I believe was, but might have been the best baseball player on that team, but I knew that one part of that data in his mind was, was based on that, that, that catch he thought I meant. Um, and I lived with that. Um, for the next couple years, and then less so, and then less so, but it's still in the back of my mind that I was the best baseball player on a team, but with an asterisk, um, because this coach was, was believing a lie. It's a form of work to hold on to secrets. Um, it's a, it takes, takes energy. It takes effort. Um, it's labor-intensive to have secret things inside. Um, and so I, I kept thinking or reflecting on work. Where did it go from there? And, and then it kind of really kicked into what we would call work, like jobs. So I had a paper route. And this one was really interesting because... Um, I was now about 10, and 
Um, my mom really liked to drill into me that strangers, you had to, you had to be scared of strangers um, and, uh, and really wanted me to be safe. And so uh, I had that in, in the back of my head that, that people were not safe when they pulled up in cars. And so as a, a paper route kid, um, I would go through these neighborhoods and every car that, that kind of stopped near me, I would live in fear. Uh, and then one time somebody like stopped and asked for directions. And I remember being like 10 feet away and, and just kind of talking at them, you know, and from a distance because there was this perception of danger. And, and there, there is danger out there. But I remember living with the, the fear um, of things and that that was the kind of work. And then it went on to more paper routes to Pizza Hut. If you want to know what the... Um, Minimum wage was in the mid '80s uh, in Virginia. It was 3.85 an hour um, at Pizza Hut, and then working at the mall in a men's clothing store. Then going on to college and working as an engineer on and off. And then um, I got to take work on a whole different level when when I was going to go to graduate school and I was going to pursue a pastoral career. It was the first time the idea of career came into my mind. And it wasn't just going to be work to get money. It was an adventure that like, I really, really wanted to give my life to. It was my calling. It was my passion. It was a, a different kind of work that brought pleasure. And I, I, I've kind of begun to realize when we're talking about work, we're, we're really covering this massive area um, of labor and effort and the things we do in this world to either get by, provide, or to create. Um, and work really has been with us since the beginning. And so in the book of Genesis, it says that God um, performs this work on the days of creation, that he, he, he gets in there with the dirt and, and kind of molds the clay, if you will, to create the world in which we live, and that after six days of work, it then goes into the seventh and says that God rested, meaning there was no labor, there was no work, and it sets up this rhythm because then God gives us this first command that we're supposed to do like him because we're made in his image, that we too are supposed to work, to tend, to nurture, to labor, to give effort, to give direction to life, and that also, like him, it's supposed to be in this certain kind of a rhythm where we rest on the seventh day. So there's a work-rest relationship or rhythm or pattern that's built into the very foundation of creation. Not only is it built into the foundation of creation, it's built into God's identity and our identity. Um, and that's pretty massive. And then you find that work doesn't go away after the fall. It just gets twisted. And so now we're going to work and we're going to go out into the fields and we're going to do those things on, on day one through six of the week. But there's going to be thorns and thistles and it's not going to really yield for us in, a, in an easy way, the way it was meant to, um, what it is that we're going to harvest from the land. And so after the fall, work gets um, complicated. And so I think it's really interesting to go in that we have to go in and we have to realize that all of this kind of factors in um, and that we realize work is a central part, not a side part of life. It's, it's not something that, that's out there that we go to and try and get through so we can come back and live normal life or real life, but that work is actually in the fabric of human existence. Um, there's a, a quote from Timothy Keller, and he says it well. He says, according to the Bible, we don't merely need the money from work to survive, but we need the work itself to survive and to live fully human lives. Um, I went through and was looking in Scripture just at, at, at what the Bible has to say about work, and, and it's so broad that you can't really narrow it down, so I thought I would just give you some markers from the wisdom books, the, the book of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. And there's an interesting kind of thing that happens in Ecclesiastes. I'll just take the first, middle, and then last verse. This is how it starts in Ecclesiastes with regard to work in chapter 2, verse 17. It talks about hating life because the work that is done under the sun is grievous. All of it is meaningless 
a chasing after the wind, which expresses probably the way some of us might feel, that it's grievous and all of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. It goes on in Ecclesiastes uh, 3.22. It says that uh, the writer saw that there is nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work because that is their lot. For who can bring them to see what will have to, uh, happen after them? So work starts out kind of as this griev- a grievous thing because it doesn't really get anywhere. It's a chasing after the wind. But life is what it is, and therefore there's nothing better than to actually find joy in your work because you won't know what will happen after. You're not working for tomorrow or for 10 years from now or for 20 years from now. You don't know what will happen then. You know today and only today. And so if you can find joy in your work, then you will be a joy-filled person. And then it ends uh, in Ecclesiastes um, verse 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 5, and it says this, that you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in mother's womb, and so you cannot understand the work of God, who is the maker of all things. And it brings us back to the mystery of God here, that we're working or laboring, that God is laboring too, but somehow we're not always going to understand why we're doing the work we're doing or where it's really going. Proverbs brings wisdom into this. It starts um, with the idea that God calls forth um, wisdom as the first of his works before his deeds of old. So this idea that before God even creates other things, he kind of creates this idea of wisdom or an ordering principle to everything. John will kind of pick up on that when he talks about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That from the very beginning, you have this kind of wisdom, another word, logos. Uh, It goes on and talks about um, working well and not chasing fantasies. And then gets to this point where it says, put your outdoor work in order and get your fields ready. After that, build your house. That there's something about our future life that's going to come from the the value of our work today. And then in an interesting twist, Proverbs 31, 31, the last mention of work in the book of Proverbs is speaking specifically to women. And it says, honor her, um, honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works Bring her praise at the city gate. Let her works bring her praise at the city gate. That there's something beautiful about exemplifying what it means to be human and being industrious and bringing about things and working well. Um, We're not just working for money, but we're working because somehow our humanity is tied up in that. Um, This rhythm is interesting. Uh, I had a little conversation with Evan Hendricks um, before the service. I don't know that we're going to be able to get on this tangent, but nothing in life anymore reinforces the, the rhythms of work that once used to, to kind of reinforce it. The, the, the idea of light uh, and dark, that night comes, we cease our labor in the field, we go to bed, we wake in the morning again, that, that commerce isn't in operation on Sundays, uh, which I remember you know, I was in my... I was in, I think, elementary school when that changed in America. I was in Perth recently, and they were talking about trading beginning to happen on Sundays, and that this was a threat or or a direct uh, challenge to the church. And I remember being really confused and going, you guys trade on Sundays? Like, there's a stock market that, that opens on Sundays? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. And they looked at me really confused, and they said, no, not a stock market, like stores, um, and that's what they called trading. Uh, it's not like that uh, in Eastern Australia, but in, in Western Australia, that's just now changing. But a lot has changed that doesn't reinforce this rhythm. We have light all the time. We can connect with each other all the time. We can do commerce all the time. And there's distractions all the time. I just saw a study that, that said uh, if the average U.S. Facebook user were to quit Facebook, the amount of of reading or occupied time that they would have, they'd be able to finish 200 books a year. 200 books a year. And it really convicted me, partly because half of the Antioch pastoral staff has gotten off social media recently. Um, Not me yet. Um, But I'm I'm seriously contemplating that that, uh, 
I'd, I'd really like to get those 200 books in. Um, I'd really like to get those 200 books in. But somehow, what reinforces this idea of Sabbath or this work-rest rhythm? The other thing that happens when this gets out of whack, the work-rest rhythm, is that we begin to be miserable because we're not in balance. And we all know that misery loves company. Um, when we're working too much or working in an unhealthy way, we want everyone to be unhealthy too. Do you know what I mean? Like we, we look at other people and always kind of try and pull them through our standard of unhealth and, and we want them there as well. The interesting thing is if we're doing it right, if we find some kind of a balance and if we're rested, there's grace there. And grace begets generosity to where we want to pull other people into a rhythm of rest, understanding what it is and what that looks like. Um, uh, Exodus when we talk about the command for Sabbath, commands the Sabbath not just for yourself, but for your workers, uh, for your animals, for your slaves, if you have slaves, for the foreigners in your midst. Basically, everyone that you are responsible for, you are responsible also for their work, rest, rhythm, or balance. Does that make sense? Um, I was really convicted this morning at about 5.30 when I was reflecting on this and thought that as a parent, that means I'm responsible for the balance with my kids in terms of work, rest. Um, and I don't know that I've really been doing a good job on that. Um, it's hard these days to keep kids in some kind of a balance to where it's not just more or more or more distraction. So I want to jump into Colossians and, and kind of go a little bit deeper here, uh, starting in verse 12. Colossians 12 on the sheet in front of you, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave. And over all these virtues, put on love, which is a work, by the way, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Um, there's an interesting book called The Call that you can pick up by Os Guinness. We have it in our library cart out back there. And The Call is more than just about work. It's about your calling and vocation, what it means to be kind of pulled into this world and kind of led forward as someone called by God. And he has an interesting passage where he talks about both Dostoevsky and um, Solzhenitsyn, both two uh, Russian writers, famous novelists. And they both had a near-death kind of experience. Dostoevsky was rounded up, put in front of a firing squad. And seconds before the firing squad was going to go, uh, there was a stay of execution because the emperor was basically trying to create a, uh, this impression. And then when he forgave them, that there would be this kind of outpouring of gratitude. But, but Dostoevsky never forgot that moment that he was living in some sense on borrowed time, that he'd been right up until the edge. And Solzhenitsyn was in a, a work camp. And they released him from the work camp because he was imminently going to die from cancer. And no sooner than did they release him that he goes back, has a miraculous recovery, and lives the rest of his life kind of in light of this grace. And so grace pervades kind of the theme of both their works and this idea of, of generosity that comes in. And so as Os Guinness is telling the story, he brings up an interesting question of us not understanding the value of work and being able to really truly give thanks for it. And he talks about listening to Bach, that we can buy that song, Ode to Joy, on iTunes, or we can get it on a CD, and we can pay 99 cents for it, and we can put it in and we can listen to it. But somehow we've disconnected the, the gratitude or the thanks that ought to go with great works of beauty. Um, that somehow listening to a song like that, the transformation, how it can affect you, how it can literally change your life, that we think the value only is 99 cents, that we don't have this thanksgiving or gratitude that comes with it. And we're to give thanks or to um, be full with this peace of Christ. Let the message of Christ dwell among us richly 
as we teach and admonish one another, and we're doing that through psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. And then we begin to transition here to work, and it says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then it carries that forward. Whatever we're doing, this looks like wives in relationship to their husbands, um, that they would be oriented to them, uh, to their husbands, and work in such a way that, that deals with the difficulty that comes in submission. Um, husbands loving their wives and treating them with respect. Children obeying their parents in everything um, because that's somehow pleasing to the Lord. Fathers not embittering your children because they will become discouraged. And then it goes on even to the extreme of a slave relationship. And it says, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it, not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving then anyone who does wrong will be repaid for the wrongs, and there is no favoritism. It is the Lord Christ that you are serving. So Paul is basically giving a a list of very close relationships and pitting it in the extreme and saying, no matter what the difficulty is in this relationship, that you would lean into it and work as if it's unto the Lord, not because that person has earned it or deserves it, not because it always feels good, but you do it because it keeps the unity and your ultimate motivation in serving or submitting here is that you know that God sees what is done and that it is him that you are serving. I want to take a a brief jump off here because we live in an individualistic culture, but um, Friedrich Nietzsche, the the German philosopher, he was a philologist by trade, but, but always... Uh, operated in this mode of philosophy, um, and he basically crafted a set of mor- uh, moral virtues that went on to affect the German culture. They say in World War I that most every single German soldier had a copy of Thus Spoke Zarathustra in their knapsack. And Nietzsche wrote a book called On, on, on the Genealogy of Morals, and he's writing it as a person who believes that God is dead, that Darwin and evolution have ended that. And so our morality built on this idea of a creator is, is now kind of um, passe and unhelpful. And he creates a, a slave and master morality, and he, he blames Judaism and Christianity for this idea of a slave morality that we, we extol these virtues of submission and humility and weakness and turning the other cheek and forgiving an, an enemy rather than getting retribution instead of coming in with what he believed were Greek virtues uh, or stronger virtues or the master class virtues, those of self-reliance, those of individuality, those of strength, those of determination, um, as opposed to kind of the servant idea. I'll, I'll read just a bit from Nietzsche. Uh, we have a picture up there. Nietzsche is an interesting guy, very much a loner. Um, uh, he would write little aphorisms, basically paragraphs at a time, not really sustained works. He would come back and write little bits. He'd have to wear two sets of glasses to be able to see. Uh, he would suffer from migraines because of syphilis that would eventually drive him crazy. And he was really trying to parse out this new idea of humanity post-God, where Jesus is no longer relevant. Listen to this. Um, this is how he puts it. I finally discovered um, two basic types and one basic difference. There are a master and morality and a slave morality. The moral discrimination of values has originated either among a ruling group whose consciousness of its difference from the ruled group was accompanied by delight, or among the ruled, the slaves and dependents of every degree. The Christian faith is from the beginning a sacrifice, sacrifice of all freedom, all pride, all self-confidence of the spirit, and at the same time, enslavement and self-mockery, self-mutilation. Modern men, with their obtuseness to all Christian nomenclature, no longer sense the gruesome superlative which lay for an antique taste in the paradoxical formula, God and the cross. 
Um, Paul is writing to us and he says, quote, it is the Lord Christ you are serving, and the word there is doulos, slave or servant. That our North Star, our Christian ethic, as we are living out this new life in Christ, that we've been set free from the, the competition and the independence and the striving, is that somehow now as we work and find joy or contentment in the work that we've been give, given, this lot that we've been given, that we're able to live these lives unto the Lord. So there's this um, interesting thing that happens here is that we learn that work is a form of worship. That work isn't its own end. It's not our master. That's why it's an interesting paradox when people used to, to worship uh, idols. And as God would say that you're, you're worshiping the works of your hands, that we somehow are worshiping the work and it gets flipped around and the idea now is that we uh, have work as worship. Um, let me just back up. Um, I and, and let me ask for forgiveness. I had incredible energy at five a.m. <laughs> and uh, and then somehow about forty-five minutes ago, my mind went fuzzy and 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 I lost a sense of myself. Um, and uh, it's so, I, uh, I don't want to just go through a list here. I want to I say a couple things about work. Um, here's the main thing I'm trying to say, because I think that we have this myth um, of this ideal job or this ideal calling where work is going to always be fun and it's always going to yield the fruit that we want. And I've really been reflecting on most of the people that God used in Scripture um, one of the more interesting ones lately is Esther. I think I was raised thinking that this was a regal queen, Esther, that this was a very envious position for someone to be in. Um, Esther was a young girl who was groomed with hundreds of other young girls to get one night with the king at his pleasure, um, away from your family as part of a harem, and that that somehow turned into finding favor with that king, but not a relationship that's built on intimacy. Uh, when Mordecai is going to her and saying, you have to speak up for the Jews and you have to intervene with the king because there's a plan to go and wipe out, ethnically cleanse uh, all of the Jewish people. Esther says, if I go to the king without him summoning me, in other words, if the king doesn't call for me and I show up in his presence, if he doesn't tip his scepter to me, then I die on the spot. The, the penalty is, is, is death. Mordecai, do you not know what, what the cost is here for me? That's not a kind of calling or work that I think most of us would, would want. Yet Mordecai comes to her and says, listen, maybe God puts you in that position for such a time as this. That like uh, Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his brothers and occupies a lot of different positions, most of them as a slave or as, as somebody working on behest of a master or even as, as, as somebody in a prison, um, but then finds himself at the behest of a king or a ruler in an opportunity or, or a position to be able to work things out for God's people, that sometimes God's call or God's work is not really what we would have for ourselves. And it might not be fun, and we might not see where it's going, yet somehow God works through that. Jesus said that my Father is always at his work, even to this day, and that we realize that somehow it's not just our work, but that God works too. I think I have Psalm 127 uh, for the screen. And Psalm 127 is, is this fascinating little um, psalm I can read it. I can read it too. Um, psalm 127, it's a, a psalm of Solomon. Um, and it really has two parts to it. It's incredibly small. It basically has the first part and then the second part is really about children, which has not, nothing to do with the first part. But the first part simply says this, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. And unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards um, stand watch in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. And unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early 
and, and in vain you stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For he, God, grants sleep to those he loves. It's a beautiful little psalm that really talks about the importance of God being at work in our work that we don't do anything ex nihilo, creating out of nothing, that all of our work acts on people that are a part of God's creation, acts on other objects that are are fabricated from things God made, but somehow we, we operate in creation. And God is not just a creator that's back in, in Genesis that made everything. God is a creator today who is actively creating. And so Jesus says, my father is always at his work. But this this verse here kind of depresses me. I don't know if it depresses you. The, the last little line is this. He grants sleep to those he loves. I haven't, I haven't slept um, well in, since t- about 2009. Um, and it's one part health. It's one part um, stress. It's one part not being fully in rhythm with a work-rest balance. I prided myself when Antioch was young as not being the pastor that would take a day off. Um, that it was, that there was, it was always work time. Kip can tell you, um, if I call, that means I'm working. So, you know, you should pick up the phone too. Um, and then when people stopped answering the phone because they didn't want to work on a Saturday night, then I'd be calling because I had like, food for them or my kids made them cookies and they wouldn't answer. Then I'd get mad like, am I not a friend too that you won't pick up the phone? But I like lost that privilege because I was always working um, and putting too many things on my plate and saying yes to too many things and not trusting that somehow God can, can work even in the rest. But I, I think that's possibly also a little bit too harsh on myself because I think that, that we balance this verse with something different we see in Paul. Um, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, something that I used to think was really interesting. Tell me how, you, how this sounds, or sounds to you or, or hits your ear, but it says this. Um, Paul gets exasperated. I mean, just imagine he's writing and then he, he just kind of gets exasperated and he says, we put no uh, stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants, do loss of God. We commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and the power of God with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as imposters, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. Um, I used to think that this passage was one of those ones that I don't, I, you don't, I don't know what to do with it. What do you do with Paul whining? That's what, it, it's what it always sounded like to me. What do you do with Paul just in the middle of a book whining? Um, and I don't see it that way anymore. Uh, I think, I think when, you, when you work hard, when you try to serve, when you try to follow, it's not always going to be easy. And there are going to be difficult times and there are going to be sleepless nights. But we endure that because somehow we know we do it as unto the Lord and that he sees all things and rewards all things. That we do it essentially as worship. That's not an excuse to try and get a work-rest balance uh, out of whack. But it is the reality that a lot of our work is going to feel like work. And that we're able to submit it to God as worship. So here's... Here's the bottom line that that I think we have for the screen. It's this, that treating your work as a form of worship is simply saying that even if work isn't living up to its purpose, you're going to live up to yours. 
that even if work, even if the job, even if the career, even if that side of it isn't giving or yielding to you something desirable or that you think you should, should have from it or need from it, that you're still going to, in that moment, live up to your side of work, which is, I do this as unto the Lord. You know, worship is in some ways magnified by the things that come hardest to us. Um, when Antioch started, there was a good friend here that was a part of the church that's moved on, but he was my age, uh, the age that I am now, had kids in high school. And I remember talking to him on many occasions, and his, his job or his career was, was literally killing him. Uh, and he would articulate just how difficult it was and how draining that was becoming for him. And, and he talked about the inability to make a career switch, and it's a difficult thing, and we know that in life now, right? That, that it's very hard to just choose which path you want to go, uh, go on. But he talked about his daughters and the age that they are and wanting to provide for them. And I remember hearing this over and over and feeling so bad for him that I, at, at one point just said, I'm so sorry. And then he kind of stopped and backed up and he says, oh, don't be sorry. I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I'm able to do that to give my life to serve my children and to do that as an act of worship. And that this has been a part or is a part of my sanctification. Um, I, was, uh, I was in London on, um, on Tuesday um, speaking the day after the bombings in Manchester and I was speaking with a guy by the name of Peter Gregg. I'd never met him before. I'd only heard of him. He founded the 24-7 prayer movement. Um, and uh, Peter and I were walking from dinner to where we were speaking. It's this old venue that John Wesley had spoken at, and it was this really cool kind of place. And, and Peter was asking me about uh, America and about just, just the climate and the way people are getting on. And I gave my best political analysis because I think I'm insightful and I was kind of explaining it and it was rather bleak and, and he, he kind of was listening. He asks really good questions and then, and then he, he looks at me and he says, so it sounds like you don't think there's much hope. And I kind of chuckled and I was like, ah, I don't know. It doesn't sound like it, does it? Um, and that was kind of the end of that. We went into the venue uh, and it was uh, some 150 kind of lawyers and finance people, late 20s, early 30s, singles, professionals uh, that we were interacting with. And Peter got up, and I kept reflecting on his question about hope. And Peter got up, and he shared his heart and grief from what had happened in Manchester and the calls that he'd been on that day and, and what he was trying to do. And, and the, the trolls on social media that had come after him and his movement, where is your God now? Um, and and how, does, how does this kind of thing happen? And so he took the opportunity to respond to those trolls and just kind of gave a couple points. But his second point was simply this. Um, it's in moments like Manchester and when ha hashtags show up, like pray, uh, pray for Manchester, he says that we, we most need to come back to our conviction that prayer works, that we're in a world filled with hope, that for every one of these stories, we can tell hundreds or thousands of other stories of the labor that is not in vain that is going on in countries all around the world. And, and even the, the, the things that come out of tragedies like this where God works and, and that we can see that too. And so he goes, we have to not lose this idea that prayer works. And I remember sitting there um, and, and, and being ministered to. Uh, and so I got up to speak and I began by saying, um, as a pastor, with, with kind of your orientation this way, it's really interesting sometimes when all of a sudden it dawns on you that you're being pastored. So when you're a pastor, sometimes it's really interesting when it dawns on you um, that you're being pastored. Happens to me a lot, by the way, with uh, the pastoral staff at Antioch and Pete, um, I wake up a lot realizing that I'm being pastored. And, uh, and it's an interesting place to be in and, and then to realize that somehow we need each other to remind each other the truths about our work 
the truths about the community of mutuality that we can carry one another's burdens, the truths that when we take this stuff, it's not in vain, that God does see that we're not lost or left alone or obscure, that when we really do have the the big questions, because when work is going great, we celebrate. When work is going difficult, we pray and we cry out to God and we ask questions. God, I don't understand um, what I'm doing. Hello, Noah, right? Um, God, nobody um, sees what I'm doing or, or how difficult it is. Jesus in the garden asking that his friends would be there by himself but feeling abandoned. Paul, when he finishes off at the end of his life and he's saying that everybody has left me, everyone, there's no one that still stands with me except a few that have come by. Um, or resources that we feel like we're sinking and we just can't keep up and somehow God promises that he's the God of salvation, that he saw the Israelites when they were in slavery and that he rescued them. In fact, the Sabbath rest, that command, is grounded in the idea that we're saved out of slavery. God says, you rest on the seventh day and the foreigner and the alien among you that that they're supposed to rest too. Why? Because you were slaves in Egypt once as well. You knew what that was like to be in the endless cycle of production, to be caught up in that where you weren't human and, and you will not, should not allow that anymore, that somehow God knows where we've come from. And when you feel like you're caught up in that, we have the God that says, I am the one that saves And I hear that cry. Um, So the question really becomes, who do we serve? Who do we pray to? Um, How do we understand our work? And ultimately, this position of joy, Mother Teresa once said, the miracle is not uh, that we do this work. The miracle is not that we do this work, but that we were happy to do it. Miracle is not that we do this work, but that we are happy to do it. Um, I don't have the words on the screen, but if I can beg of you one more thing uh, this morning, I'd love for you to stand and just uh, try to recite the Lord's Prayer with me um, and that we give it back to God and then we're going to enter into a time of prayer in the sides over here, of worship with the team coming back out, of participating in the Lord's table, as we understand by doing so, as we pattern ourselves by doing so, that we are in need of grace, of sustenance to sustain and keep our, uh, ourselves as we go forward, that ultimately we pray about our daily bread. So let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 